Hi, everyone. Welcome back. This is a podcast where we will be talking about crime on a street near you. Now, we will discuss a variety of different cases, crimes, of course, the victims in the crime, and the significance that the case holds. I am your host, Ava, and without further ado, let's just jump right on in with this case. It is quite an interesting case that happened locally, and that is of George Emile Banks. George Emile Banks was born June 22, 1942, and he was part of a mixed racial family. He is the mass murderer behind the 1982 shootings that took place on Schoolhouse Lane in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and Heather Highlands Trailer Park in Jenkins Township, Pennsylvania. Now, these shootings took place September 25th, 1982, which marks this year 40 years since this horrific crime took place. Many people classify him as the first spree killer in Pennsylvania. Now, I don't know how true this statement is, but it would be interesting to see what other individuals think. Is he the first spree killer in Pennsylvania? Was there somebody before him? I found this to be quite interesting to classify this individual as that, as I'm not very sure if this is true or any individuals were classified as this before him. Many individuals also classify him as a cold-blooded killer, which we will get more into the details of the case later on in this episode, but this is something that comes up quite a bit in this case. Banks fatally shot 13 people, five of which were his own children. He committed this crime using an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and was rumored to be dressed in military fatigues. Now, this is less than a three-mile radius from the Wilkes University and King's College campus, so you have to keep that in mind, that this is something that happened relatively very close, but I think it's an important case to talk about because I think many individuals don't know about it, or they're too young to know about it, or they were not from around this area. So I think that this is a good case to talk about so that everybody gets to know what happened and the victims of the crime. Now, this case was very big for its time. It was everywhere. It was in the New York Times. It was nationwide news. I mean, it was everywhere. Before we get more into the crime, I want to give a little bit of a background of what Banks did leading up to the crime. So we're going to start when Banks was 17. At 17, Banks joined the army. However, he was discharged probably after two years with many disagreements with his superiors. In 1961, he was convicted of armed robbery in the shooting of a tavern keeper. For this crime, he was sentenced 6 to 15 years. However, in 1964, he ended up being hit with more time as he was rumored to briefly escape for a little bit. In 1964, his sentence was commuted, which allowed him to be granted parole in 1969, meaning he served eight years for the armed robbery and the shooting of the tavern keeper. Now, after being released, it seemed as if his criminal activities significantly calmed down. It seemed like his life was on the up and up. He had a couple different jobs. He had some children. He had his own house. It seemed like he was living a relatively good lifestyle. Then in 1980, he ended up becoming a prison guard at Camp Hill, which is in Harrisburg. But this is one of the things in the case that didn't make sense to me as we know that he was an ex-convict. So how did he get this job? Was it a mistake on somebody's part? Did they just completely look past it? Or did they know about his past and give him sort of a pardon to be able to work in this type of setting? I'd be curious to see if anybody else knows about this and how this came to be. I also cannot verify this next part, but there was rumors that weeks before the shooting that Banks had actually locked himself in a guard tower with a shotgun and threatened to kill himself. 
There was also some rumors that a couple guards mentioned Banks talked about a mass killing and that he had made threats against himself and his children. Because of this odd behavior that was starting to occur, they placed him on medical leave and told him that he should visit a mental facility to get help. He was scheduled to see a psychologist on September 29th, 1982. However, a couple days prior is when this horrific crime took place. Now, let's talk about the day of the shooting. The day of the shooting started somewhere around 2.30 in the morning and lasted until sometime after 11 a.m. Before the shootings took place, it was rumored that Banks was drinking a lot of gin and was on a couple different prescription drugs. Then he ended up shooting the people in his home. He came outside and shot two bystanders in the street who were attending a party across the street. One of these individuals was James Olson. He was the only survivor who was shot that day and ended up surviving. The other individual was Raymond Hall, who unfortunately did not survive. Olson was hospitalized for months because of this, and he received a, di- wound, a gunshot wound directly to the chest. I can't even begin to imagine how James Olson feels. I know he is still alive. He has made a couple interviews about this day. And I know that he went on to live what seems like a relatively normal lifestyle. He has a couple children. He enjoys doing various things, and he lives with his mom currently. After everything that took place in Schoolhouse Lane, he then went to Jenkins Township, where he shot four people at Heather Highland's trailer park. He then abandoned his car and hijacked another. Knowing full well that Police probably knew everything that happened on Schoolhouse Lane at this point. He decided to leave low for a while, which is exactly what he did. After laying low for a while, he went to his mother's house where he appeared very distraught. He was extremely emotional and he told his mother that he had killed everybody. Now, she didn't really understand what he was talking about. She thought that maybe he was just drunk and talking nonsense. So she decided to call home to make sure everyone was well. This is when the police answered the phone and the gruesome crime that laid in front of them. In order to try to locate Banks, officials told Banks that his children were still alive. They were trying to do this to get him to talk as long as possible so that they could find him. They also even did a fake broadcast, which I believe they did on WILK radio to convince Banks that his kids were alive, severely wounded and critical, and that they needed blood immediately. After knowing that the police knew everything and that they'd be looking for him, he went to a vacated rental house in wilkes Bear on Monroe Street, and this is where the four-hour standoff between banks and officials began. A former co-worker named Robert Brunson, who we need to include in this podcast, is a very important part, he heard the devastating news and everything that took place, and he knew that he needed to help in some way and get banks the help that he needed. So he went down to the scene and told them that he thinks he could talk Banks down. He was the only individual that was able to get through Banks' mind and was able to get him to surrender that day. Before I discuss um, some officials who worked the case, I'd like to discuss the victims because this is a very important aspect of the entire case. A little disclaimer, this can be some gruesome evidence. I'm going to talk about the wounds that these individuals sustained. So, disclaimer for this. I'm going to start with Sharon Mazzillo. She was 24 at the time of the crime. She is the former girlfriend of George Banks, who is engaged in a custody battle over their son, Kisumayu Banks. She received a gunshot wound to the chest. Their son, Kitsumayu Banks, five, suffered a gunshot wound to the face. 
Scott Mozilla was seven. He was the nephew of Sharon, and he received a gunshot wound to the face. Alice Mozilla, 47, Sharon's mother, was shot in the face while on the phone with the police. Regina Clements, 29, girlfriend of George Banks, received gunshot wound to the face. Montanzima Banks, 6, daughter of Regina and George, gunshot wound to the heart. Susan Uhas, 23, girlfriend of George, sister of Regina, gunshot wound to the head. Bowen Day Banks, 4, son of Susan and George, gunshot wound to the face. Martinia Banks, 20 months, daughter of Susan and George, gunshot wound to the face. Dorothy Lyons, 29, girlfriend of George, gunshot wound to the neck. Nancy Lyons, 11, daughter of Dorothy, gunshot wound to the head. Barood Banks, 1, son of Dorothy and George, gunshot wound to the head. We also have the two victims we talked about earlier, Raymond Hall, who's 24, the bystander who had been attending a party across the street. He had a gunshot wound to the kidney and liver. James Olson was 22. He was the individual who survived a direct gunshot wound to the chest. It is said that Banks was in very, very close proximity to Olsen when he shot him in the chest. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the individuals who were involved in this case. Now, I want to mention that these are not all the individuals on the case. There were more who worked the case, but these are just a couple people that I'd like to mention. First, let's talk about Robert Gillipsy. He was Luzerne County District Attorney. He is now deceased, but he said after visiting the scene, it was just like a horror movie, which many individuals who worked the case that day have the same story. It was a it was a horrific scene, a horrific more movie. There was blood everywhere, bodies. It was just such a devastating scene. We also have Jim Zardecki, who's chief county detective on the case, and Michael DeSoy, who was county detective at the time and is now the chief county detective. We also have one of his defenders, who is Al Flora. He was fresh out of law school, and he was the assistant public defender for Luzerne County. Upon meeting with Banks, Al Flora said that you could tell he was very intelligent, but he was severely mentally ill. And the team was going to do everything to declare him incompetent and not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, against the judgment of his people that worked the case, Banks testified on his own behalf and was found guilty on 12 counts of first-degree murder, one count third-degree murder, attempted murder, aggravated assault, one count robbery, theft, and endangering the life of another person. I just mentioned a couple minutes ago about Chief County Detective Michael DeSoy, who worked the case. His brother also worked the case. His name is Gerard DeSoy, and he was a rookie cop on the case at the time. I actually had the pleasure and the honor of talking with Chief County Detective Mr. Michael DeSoy, and we talked about a couple different things about the case, but one thing that we talked about and that stuck in my mind is how both him and his brother, Gerard, arrived at the scene on Monroe Street, and they both could have easily been shot by Banks. Banks was pointing his gun directly for them, and he said that, my opinion is, Banks knew if he shot at us, he would be killed or shot. George Banks wasn't ready to die yet. He knew we would have killed him. He eventually came out. If he wanted to die, he would have gotten into a gunfight with us. This is something that really stuck with me as I do find it true. I think that if Banks wanted to die today, he would have gotten a gunfight or he would have ended up killing himself sometime through this long day. So I think that just shows that he wanted to be alive. I also asked Mr. DeSoy the question of, do you think this crime could have been prevented? He told me he honestly did not know the answer to this question. He also did confirm for me that George Emil Banks was drinking gin the night of the killings. 
Banks could have easily been shot, but it was urged by the Wilkesbury police chief at the time to capture him alive if possible. Then we're going to talk about um, the death warrants and how Banks ended up not being executed at all and just still being on death row to this day. So this begins in 1996. The first death warrant was written by Governor Tom Ridge. However, he ended up receiving a stay of execution. Then in 1999, the same governor signs another death warrant. However, this time, federal judges issued Banks' stay. He was supposed to be executed on May 12, 2010, but Judge Joseph Agello overturned this due to his mental incompetence, and he now sits on death row. Through my research, I stumbled across something that apparently was said by Judge Agello at the time, and he wrote that this was something that was a factor in deeming him incompetent at the time. It said that he had a fixed false belief, a delusion, that his sentence had been vacated by God, the governor, and former President George W. Bush. He believes he is in prison illegally and that he should be going home. He should be out there ministering to the people, but there is a conspiracy against him. This just shows that there could have very well been something going on in George Bank's mind. It seemed like his mind was a little bit all over the place. So that is why they ended up deeming him incompetent. There was a, a couple different factors, but this is what ended him not being executed and sitting on death row. Despite declaring his mental incompetence, there are still many individuals out there that no matter what think he deserved the death penalty either way. Banks is still alive. He is about 80 years old at this point, and he is housed at a prison in Montgomery County, Bradford Maximum Security Facility. This is about 30 miles west of Philadelphia, and he's been here since about 1985. For privacy reasons, I will not be naming this individual. However, through a close friend and contact of mine, I found out that someone closely related to them was a prison guard for many years, and he happened to be one of the guards on death row who guarded Banks. He guarded Banks for about five years or so. He recalls that Banks became very religious, and after killing all the people, he ultimately turned to the Bible. He said he never really watched anything or did much. The only thing he really did was read his Bible. To this day, we don't know exactly the true motives as to why he did this. He did say a couple times they died because he loved them and he was trying to prevent them from growing up in a world with racism. But other than that, we really have no idea why he did this. Banks apparently said in an interview with officials, I can't explain what was going on in my mind. He said he wouldn't believe it. This case was a lot to unpack. There are many things involved in this case. Many interesting things, many things to keep in the back of your mind. This case is important because despite how you may feel about this individual, it shows that mental illness is a very serious thing and it should not be taken lightly. We see how fragile the mental mind is, especially in this case, and I learned a lot in this case. I knew just a little bit about Banks in the past, but I learned so much while investigating this, and I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to investigate this, dig a little deeper, and to do this podcast about it. I would be curious to see more on what you guys out there think about this case, if you knew about it, um, if you have any theories behind some of the stuff that I said in the earlier parts of the episode. And I just want to say thank you for sticking with, that, sticking with me for the duration of this podcast. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who helped this podcast come to light, especially Chief County Detective Michael DeSoy for taking the time to talk with me about this case, to give me a little bit of insight, to answer some of my questions, and 
Also, I was able to see some photos that I did not find in my research, which I found very interesting. It gave me a different opportunity to look at it from somebody else's perspective, which I really appreciate. That's all I have for you guys today. See you next time.